We're at the Gulf Film Festival in Dubai, looking at the Emirates' ambitious plans to set up a film industry where none really existed before. But can Emirati films wean local audiences off their love of Hollywood? Also coming up this week, tightening the rules. The UAE proposes new business laws to restore investor confidence, but is it too little, too late? Your home is at risk. Banks get tough on repossessing property, but could it push prices down further? And the Grand Prix is not enough. We're trackside in Abu Dhabi as it welcomes the GT World Championship. But who can afford to compete? But first, when the makers of Sex in the City asked if they could film their new movie here, they were politely turned down. A holiday destination for steamy romance is not the kind of image that the government here in Dubai wants to promote. But that's not to say that the authorities aren't keen on local films being made here. A lot of time and money is spent on encouraging local filmmakers to do just that. But will local films beat Hollywood at their own game? Neil Heathcote has been finding out. In an old house in an abandoned village in Ras Al Khaimah, shooting is underway on Dolb Al Shams, or the sun's dress. Set in the 1960s, it tells the story of a local woman who is deaf and mute. This is the final day of filming, and the crew has to work fast to get the remaining shots completed in time. Scenes like this are becoming increasingly common around the Gulf as a new generation discovers filmmaking. Working often with the backing of the government, they're keen to tell stories and show a way of life that's a long way removed from what Hollywood has to offer. It's director Saeed Salmin's first feature film. He's hoping the human story will touch a chord with audiences around the world, but he knows it's unlikely to get commercial distribution. It's a film that will primarily be shown at festivals. It's not that I don't want to work on Hollywood-style movies, but here in the Gulf we're trying to be creative and say something. It's like Iranian cinema. Their movies reflect strong ideas and messages. We don't sell enough tickets to make profitable movies. Any Emirati movie maker who makes a really successful film still wouldn't make any money out of it. The Gulf Film Festival is one place you can come to get noticed. It's a forum for young filmmakers to exchange ideas, build up contacts and create some media buzz. Making money is not a priority. Ali Mustafa made the opening night film City of Life. It's the first Emirati feature to get a commercial release. But even so, finding backers was a struggle. You know, a lot of people um, have this uh, interpretation that the Gulf is, is a very rich place, which is understandable. But they invest, you know, a lot of the investors invest their money in stuff that they're aware of, which is real estate uh, and so forth, and, 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 and things that they know best. C cinema and, and film is almost alien to that. But it's slowly... I think we're slowly breaking that uh, stereotype. And the more films we make, the more people are going to be aware of it, and I think it might be easier than to start funding films. A film is a story you tell with images. Instead, much of the support for aspiring filmmakers currently comes from the government. At free sessions like this, young locals get to hear at first hand what it takes to be a producer. The government set up the festival to showcase and encourage local talent. With its workshops, awards and prizes, the goal is to kick-start an industry that has, up until now, simply not existed. Filmmaking in the Gulf is the last frontier in filmmaking. Uh, if you see and look at the, the world, they, were, they all had some, some sort of uh, experience with filmmaking, except the Gulf, uh, because of so many reasons. Uh, so I think the, um, the idea is really to, um, uh, to make uh, the, the cinema in the Gulf to create an industry uh, from scratch. So we have to also be patient because we cannot cross 100 years and 3 or 10 years, but we probably could do it in 40, but not, not really to in, 10, uh, in 10 years. It's an ambitious project, but veterans warn that Hollywood will dominate commercial cinema in the Gulf for a long time to come. Walid al Shehi has been making documentaries here for 10 years. He's setting up a course to help other filmmakers benefit from his experience. 
But students, he says, should do it because they want to, not for the money. Profit or the commercial side is not a target for us at all. Yeah, for myself, at the beginning, I was taking loans. And I, you know, I knew that I will never pay back this uh, from the film itself. But we just kept doing it, and we'll I will keep doing it until we reach the, uh, the satisfaction point, at, le at least for ourselves, uh, where we said we, we did something. And you. Enthusiasm is what sustains the Gulf's low-budget filmmakers. One day, they may rise to challenge Hollywood's commercial success. But in the meantime, it's not cash, but the chance of an international profile that's got them dreaming of a brighter future. Neil Heathcote reporting there. Now, it's said that the impact of the financial crisis was so severe here in Dubai because the proper checks and balances were not in place. Investors who lost money here found that they had little legal recourse. So, in an effort to boost transparency and restore investor confidence, the UAE is proposing a raft of new business laws. But is it too little, too late? A question I put to Joad Ali, managing partner at law firm King & Spaulding. Recognizing that the laws are not sufficient is a very, very good start. Now, I am always a glass half full type of person. I see that as a very, very good you know, signal from the government. What's to say that the new laws will be any good? We actually don't know the answer to that because these laws are being drafted uh, in, uh, you know, behind closed doors. They're being drafted by uh, you know, the uh, relevant authorities. There is limited input from uh, the private sector and uh, the international uh, uh, community or international investor uh, community. Of course, I think the government has a dialogue with investors, has a dialogue with the private sector, and takes note of what people are asking for by way of change. But it remains to be seen how much uh, of those uh, views will make it to the final draft of these um, proposed legislation. But it's not just a case of finding out what people and businesses want. You can already see that. There are two systems working in tandem here. You've got Dubai proper, the courts that work in Arabic, where it takes years to get things done. Then you've got DIFC. It's an English language medium, and it appears to be working very smoothly. So why not just implement what happens there in Dubai proper? I think part of the uh, proposed legislation is going to be taking the uh, experience of the DIFC courts and uh, arbitration and mediation uh, uh, center and exporting it out of the DIFC to Dubai proper. What we're hearing is that the new legislations are going to even allow more companies that are outside the DIFC to avail themselves from that system. But what if the new laws are not deemed sufficient or the right thing by investors, what can they do? Every single investor investing anywhere in the world wants to know with certainty what would the outcome be. He or she may not like that outcome, but at least they need to make a calculated, educated decision about their investment. If the new laws enable the creditors to have some comfort to perfect their securities, it will go a long way. It would be really um, it'd be a new beginning. Uh, for, for, the, for the Middle East, led by the UAE. Jawad Ali of King & Spaulding speaking to me earlier. Now, the UK's Royal Bank of Scotland got into so many difficulties that it had to be nationalised. And as it restructures, it's looking to sell its operation here in the United Arab Emirates. Philip Hampshire finds out who would want to buy a second-hand bank. To get an idea of just how many banks there are here in the Emirates, all you have to do is come down here. To Khalid bin Al Walid Road. In fact, if you ask most people, they wouldn't even recognize that name because they generally refer to it simply as Bank Street. And it's easy to see why. In fact, if you simply stood here, closed your eyes, and swung a stick around over your head, the chances are you'd hit three or four banks in the process. There are 53 banks offering services in the Emirates, making it proportionately one of the most fragmented markets in the world. For one bank, though, Royal Bank of Scotland, this may be good news. Following its nationalisation, it's looking to sell its assets in the region. But although the media say Emirates MBD are interested in buying them, are they really or is it all just talk? Without being rude to Royal Bank of Scotland, the assets probably aren't that attractive. What are we looking at here? You'll be looking at um, a mixture of corporate finance, trade finance and some uh, retail banking assets. 
they're to an extent ten a penny. It's a question of who here believes they can push those assets, sweat those assets and make more money out of them. Unfortunately, of course, the economic situation in the United Arab Emirates at the moment is such that trying to sweat those assets a little bit harder is going to fall down because there's not much you can do with them at the moment. Of course, there's more to this for RBS than simply selling off a unit to get some cash. It allows them to retreat a little from an international strategy that wasn't entirely working out. If you were to have an account with the Royal Bank of Scotland in, say, Swansea in Wales and then move to Abu Dhabi and try and go into a branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland in Abu Dhabi and take out some money, they'd tell you they simply couldn't do it. It's simply not possible for most banks to talk to one another in the internet age. It's not just RBS that has this problem either. Most of the international banks do. Tim Searle is CEO of wealth management advisor Global Eye. With operations in Europe, Asia and the Middle East, he has to deal with multiple banks all the time. For example, our operations in Singapore, we use a completely different banking operation to that we use offshore and that we use here in Dubai, purely because the benefits outweigh doing that and opposed to trying to stick with our existing banking partners. Um, there could be legislative issues, there could be sort of facilities that are not available, it could be a pre-requirement for uh, setting up operations in a different country. Um, ideally you're absolutely right and that wouldn't it be just have one bank that can cater for everything. There's a number that purport to do that but very few that actually do. One of the financial institutions that's been listening to its customers is HSBC. Their brand HSBC Premier claims to offer the first truly international bank where your account can be fully accessed anywhere in the world in any Premier branch. But what is it about international banks that it's taken them so long to allow international banking? Well, I think like many things in life, you know, the devil's in the detail and things aren't always as easy as they might appear. You know, when you're dealing with uh, 82 different countries, you're dealing with different regulatory environments, you're dealing with different uh, systems from perhaps different organizations or, or regional or geographic locations, connecting all of that together is actually a massive uh, infrastructure investment. And it does take time, it takes significant investment. Um, but I think what we're seeing is it's well worth that investment. Right now, HSBC Premier is only available to those customers with $100,000 invested with the bank. Of course, the history of financial services tends to indicate that a product that right now is only supplied to the wealthy because of competition in a few years' time will be supplied to absolutely everyone. Philip Hampshire reporting there. Right, we're going to take a short break now when we come back. All in a spin, the GT1 Championship kicks off in Abu Dhabi, but who can afford to compete? Welcome back to the programme. I'm Nima Abuwardi. We're at the Gulf Film Festival in Dubai. Now, up until recently, home repossessions here were practically unheard of. The market is moving so fast that banks preferred to settle defaults out of court or write them off as bad debt. But in the wake of the city's property sub, banks are trying to claw back some of what they're owed. But could a glut of cheap, distressed property hitting the market push prices down even further? Well, that's a question I put to Alexis Waller, head of real estate at Clyde & Co. They're very conscious of the fact that we're already in a depressed market. Prices are already at distressed sale prices. So they're conscious of not adding to, to that. They're also looking at other options, perhaps restructuring loans or, or looking at other forms of security that they hold because we have to bear in mind that often the value of the mortgage is higher than the value of the property. So it might not even be in the best interest of the bank to go for foreclosure straight away. They'll look at other options. So can you tell us a bit more about this new mortgage law, the detail of it? We have certainty in terms of that we have a law. Before that we didn't, so any mortgage case was treated in the same way as a civil matter. It went through the courts, could take one or two years, could be expensive. We now have a procedure that goes straight to an execution judge, so there is process for foreclosure. An attachment order is made and then the property can be sold uh, at auction by the land department. Your community of professionals, how did you react when the Barclays case came to be. 
these kind of cases happen all over the world in established markets, it shows that Dubai has now got to that level. It's a positive sign for the lenders. They know that they have a procedure in place. It's been tried and tested. It's been successful. It avoids some of the risks and uncertainty that they were facing before. Doesn't this further depress the market? Doesn't this mean that prices will go down? What the market needs is banks to start lending again. It's one of the factors that's led to the depressed prices. So giving the banks some certainty in that regard uh, can only help there. I think it's really how it evolves in practice. We, we have a law now that has a clear procedure set out. What we need to know is how these things happen in practice and you can only know by looking at how many go through the courts. We know of this case, we know that there are other cases pending. Uh, from that we will be able to establish an average timeline whether it's two to four months uh, for a case to be heard or whatever it is. So it's, it's very much an evolving case in terms of looking what happens in practice now that we have the law. Alexis Waller of Clyde & Co speaking to me earlier. Right, I'm going to see what is showing at the cinema and I'll leave you with the other business stories that are making headlines across the region this week. Visitors to Qatar will have to apply for a visa before arriving in the country under new rules being proposed by the government. From the 1st of May, residents of 33 countries, including the GCC, the UK and the USA, will be required to arrange their visas in advance. Officials say the process will take two to three days, but haven't explained why the changes are being introduced. Iraq still owes more than $24 billion to Kuwait in compensation for its invasion of the country in 1990. The head of the Kuwaiti Budget Committee said the country had received just half of the money it was promised in a UN-brokered deal. Iraq is currently required to put 5% of its oil revenues into a UN reparations fund that has repeatedly appealed to Kuwait to waive the repayments. It's already established itself on the Grand Prix calendar and this weekend, for the first time, the Yas Marina circuit in Abu Dhabi will host the first GT1 World Championship race. But in the midst of a recession, who has the money to compete and is there any money to be made from big sporting events like this? Ben Thompson has fun finding out. <laughs> It might look and sound like Formula One, but this is very different. The high-spec vehicles of F1 have been replaced with everyday sports cars. They've been given an extra boost, of course, and some fine-tuning. But this is GT1, and here in Abu Dhabi, they're preparing for this weekend's World Championship. It's the first race of the season, so all eyes are on and off the track to see whether it can pull in the crowds and make money in the midst of a global recession. It's not an easy business, you know, outside of Formula One, uh, motorsport is, is not the easiest place to make money, but uh, we think the fundamentals are right. Sponsorship has been difficult, that's really the field where it has been more, most affected, but as I said, you know, there are also it created a, a, a kind of a vacuum. Three, four years ago, you had a lot of different series competing against each other, so it was difficult to market any series because, you know, there was no, simply not, not space on sport channel, not space for promoters. So now a number of these series have gone under. So at the end, I hope the best will prevail and we hope we'll be the best. So to find out what all the fuss is about, they've invited me here to Yas Marina Circuit. Now I've got the helmet. All I need now is a car and a driver. So I've found a car. This is a Nissan GTR and I found a driver. This is Jamie. Campbell Walter. Now, Jamie, you're going to be driving this weekend. Uh, you've been driving for more than 20 years. So what is it about GT1 that makes it so popular? They're all cars that every single guy here can go and buy if they can afford it. You know, I think this brings a lot of appeal. People can go, oh, you know, that's my favourite car. Kids at school can have a poster of a, a GTR or a Maserati or Aston Martin on the wall. That's their dream car. And I think that brings a lot of appeal to this championship. You can relate to the cars, whereas a Formula One car is a, it's, not, it's nothing like a real road car, whereas these cars are, you know, real road cars. So, Jamie, you're going to take me for a spin around the circuit, so let's go. Let's go. Come on. But of course, whilst it's good fun, it's also big business. For car makers who faced a bumpy few years, events like GT1 are key. The 
because the cars here are more within the price range of consumers, they can show off their new products to a receptive audience. For the teams too, it's also much cheaper to take part in this championship. Thanks to its expensive technology and high-end vehicles, F1 is 10 times more expensive than GT1. But take a look around and there isn't much local involvement. Whilst it is an international sport, all the brands and teams here are from overseas. So there are now calls to nurture and develop local talent too. Where's the local driver? Where's the Arab driver in Formula One? And so in order for that to come true, uh, we have to give them a way in which they can train, get the experience and start on the ladder, on the career ladder to Formula One. And the GT1 World Championship starting in Abu Dhabi is terrific news because it creates all sorts of incentives and interest because for motorsport to work you have to have spectators. If you have spectators you have sponsors. If you have sponsors then racing drivers can go up the ladder because to get to Formula One it's 10 years of hard work and probably about 10 million dollars and that doesn't come from dad. That comes from sponsors who are willing to support the ambitions of a local driver. So back on track, final preparations are underway for a weekend of racing. Of course, the championship has some tough competition, not least from the industry heavyweight Formula One. But it could find that in the wake of a recession, a low-cost alternative to F1 could be just what the market needs. Ben Thompson racing around Abu Dhabi there. Well, our time is very nearly up. I do hope you've enjoyed our programme. But before we go, let's see how the region's main markets finish the week. And remember, we'd love to hear from you, your thoughts about the programme and about any stories you think we should be doing about where you live. The email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Now, next week we're in Lebanon, which is hosting its first motor show in five years. Can the world's car makers convince buyers there to ditch the second-hand car market and splash out on a new set of wheels? Until then, from me, Nima Abuarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.